now over two and a half million Muslims in the UK, many of whom might not be aware of Quilliam and his pioneering Victorian mosque. Unfortunately, not enough people, whether they're Muslim or non-Muslim, know about the legacy which Abdullah Quilliam left behind. Abdullah Quilliam was way ahead of his time and he managed to achieve more than 100 years ago what we as a Muslim community here in the UK uh, haven't yet achieved. What he managed to do, which is the most amazing thing, was translate the message of the Prophet Muhammad into a context which made it suitable for the people of Britain. It's essential. It's essential that everybody knows about this man, everybody knows about the mosque, and everybody knows about the work which he did. We can all take lessons from him. Quilliam left Britain and the mosque in 1908. Without his charismatic leadership, his congregation dwindled, and the mosque was later sold on to the council. There are now ambitious plans to restore this unique building back to Quilliam's original vision. It's remarkable the role that this mosque has had in the social history of this country, and I think it's a really important and uplifting story to tell for this country, and I hope that they raise the funds to bring this mosque back to life again. My dad and I can't believe it. It's like we never left home. This was the first house to be built in Guyman. It looks a little bit like a buffin, a little sweet cottage that you might find on the hillsides in Wales somewhere. And I've timed my trip perfectly, because today is March the 1st, Deeth Goyal Dewi, St David's Day. What da. Don't know why I've decided to greet everyone and think it's just my excitement. What da. Bora da Shemai. I don't speak Welsh. I know, I know, I knew that, but it's just really, really odd. Bora da Shemai Shadichi. Just as we do in Wales, these Patagonian school children are celebrating our patron saint. It's surreal, but also rather moving. Lynette. Hello, Sinhuil. Get in. Thank you so much for your time today. My journey to Patagonia wouldn't be complete without finding a descendant of the visionary Michael D. Jones. My grandfather, Louis da Piwan, he was uh, Michael D. Jones' son, and when he came to Patagonia and had a farm, he named the farm Body One. What do you think your great granddad would make of the situation here now? Things have changed a lot. He would be surprised, I suppose, to see how the towns have grown. And I think he would be happy to see that the language is still spoken. The non-Welsh speakers, the local people, if you like, what is their attitude towards the Welsh speakers and, and the history behind it? They learn in time that it's important. <laughs> they learn. Are they told by a certain Leonid? <laughs> no, I try to be diplomatic. <laughs> <laughs> I'm proud that in 1865, my countrymen and women had the courage to endure a hazardous two-month sea voyage to save Welsh language and culture from extinction. It's been an unforgettable trip to one of Britain's most secret of homes, from the vision of Michael D. Jones and the bravery of the early settlers to the amazing Leonard who still flies the dragon. There'll be some corner in a foreign field it will always be forever Wales. When Hitler began threatening the security of Europe, Nancy decided to use her talents as a hostess to try to ease international tensions. She organised a dinner party designed to halt the German advance. This was recorded by her niece, Joyce Grenfell. Nancy invited the ambassadors of America, Russia, and, of course, Hitler's Germany. After a six-course dinner, she revealed the final stage of her cunning plan. I've got a wonderful idea. Why don't we all play a parlor game? In her effort to avert war between the great powers, Nancy persuaded their ambassadors to play musical chairs. She left nothing to chance and made sure that the German ambassador won. She wanted this to be a success. 
if there was going to work, this informality, chasing around the table, playing musical chairs. <laughs> not a bad idea of the Germans. They might not like losing. However, the dinner did not lead to any diplomatic breakthrough. I can't believe I'm about to play on the very first lawn tennis court. But Chris has challenged me to dress up like Jem and Pereira back in the 1860s. And one thing's for sure, these shoes have no spring at all. And he's also set me up against Hannah, the captain of Birmingham University Tennis Club. Could be an early exit. Hi, Hannah. Are you ready? Ready. All right, perfect. Uh, I'm just a moment, and... Mr. Rosetsky. Yes. Uh, I'm your umpire for this afternoon. Oh, very nice to meet you. Bob Holland, nice how do you do? I'm good, uh, thank you. I regret that you're not able to play with that racket. You must be playing with this racket. OK, let's keep to the tradition, then. Thank you very much. Here we go. Take it easy on me, OK? What Bob didn't tell me at the time was that I would also be playing the original rules. Right. Might have helped. Fault. Why is that a fault? You have to have one foot in front of the baseline and one foot behind the baseline. All right, so I get the foot fault in modern terms. That's exactly right. Fault. Now, why is that a fault again? You need to be within one racket's length at the center of the baseline. OK. Fault. Now, come on, you cannot be serious now. You should be serving underarm, not overarm. Are you sure that's it? Absolutely. OK. Anything else I need to know? I'll let you know. OK. Quality's still there. That's point to Mr. Rosetsky. Okay.